Hello, this is Hunter McDermott with another episode of Guitar Blog. This is uh, episode number 25. Uh, it is Thursday, February 6th at 5.07 p.m. Uh, so I've been away the past couple weeks uh, for work stuff. Um, and before that, I was spending a lot of time actually preparing a bunch of music for said work thing, which is cool. Uh, but it meant I wasn't playing a whole lot of jazz. Um, but I'm back now, and I've been thinking about a few things. Um, one of which is about chords and comping. So there's a, a great uh, YouTuber named Jens Larsen. He does jazz guitar videos, a whole lot of them, in fact. Um, it seems like he puts out like three a week or something like that. It's just crazy how much he's got to say, and it's all pretty fantastic. Um, I don't watch all of them, but occasionally things catch my eye, usually having to do with uh, comping, which is something that I find somewhat mystifying, but uh, really, really interesting, something I want to work on. And so I was listening today to um, a saxophone player named Ben Wendell. He does also on YouTube a series called Standards with Friends. And so he gets together with just him and one other player, um, Sometimes it's a singer or a drummer or uh, a guitar player or whatever. It's a lot of really interesting duos um, with him. And he did one with Mike Moreno, who's a, a fantastic guitar player, whose music took me a while to get into because it's, I guess, like a lot of modern, a lot of the modern jazz players, the up and coming guys are, you know, they're not doing stuff like what I'm studying. You know, they're not. They are sometimes playing standards, and certainly they have done that plenty in the past, but they spend their time composing a lot more modal-type stuff and things that are just sort of wacky and all over the place, uh, and that's cool. But it meant that it was a little harder for me to understand and appreciate. I guess it just kind of sounded like noodling, <laughs> but my ear is getting better to the point where I can appreciate uh, some, some more stuff like that. I am still struggling to like Laj Lund. I cannot get into that guy's music, but... I would have said this about Mike Moreno and Kreisberg and who's the other one, Rosenwinkel, uh, you know, a year or two ago that I didn't like what they did, but now I love those three guys, um, and I'm, I'm trying to trying to like Lodge as well. Julian Lodge, I love Lodge Lund, not so much, but give me a year or two and I'll be singing a different tune, I'm sure. Anyway, Mike Moreno, uh, a fantastic comper, uh, and that video uh, with him and Ben. Wendell, they do um, On Green Dolphin Street, and it opens uh, with kind of like B-roll, or the camera was rolling while Ben was getting set up, and Mike was already ready, so he's just kind of noodling, and he's playing um, There Will Never Be Another You, and he's just kind of comping on it. I guess, I guess he's playing the melody, too, a little bit of a chord melody type of thing, but it's just beautiful, and then it cuts right to On Green Dolphin Street, the proper performance for that video. And him being the only comping instrument in that duo, you know, he's, he's holding his ground uh, and then just doing a lot of really beautiful stuff. And it's like it's dense and these cool, like, close voicings. This kind of sound going on with his voicings, which is really neat. And, uh, and I want to be able to do more stuff like that. Anyway, uh, back to Jens Larsen. His video uh, was talking about um, taking these common voicings, so things like this major seven chord forcing and, it, and taking the root out and just playing it like this, playing it like a triad. So that bass note is, is sort of implied. And of course, this is something I'm not totally unfamiliar with. Playing with, with a bass player means you have more freedom and not that there's anything wrong with playing the root, but you don't have to. And by not doing so, you can free yourself up. You can play fewer notes uh, and you can you can play, uh, without worrying about that root in there, you can play extensions, things like that. And that's his, I, that's his approach. So he's saying, uh, if you look at it like this, this is um, a C-sharp arpeggio now. C-sharp minor arpeggio. So then you can play these arpeggios. Um, if I can remember how they go. Let's see. I need to work on my triads. those three voicings for 
which is A. Right. Uh, but then the idea is that now you're only using you know three fingers or however many. You're using fewer fingers. You're not getting this four note voicing now. So that you got your pinky or whatever else that you can play around with stuff. So you could do raise the fifth and make it a thirteen. Is that right? Yeah. Um. Anyway, it's just kind of starting to free you up a little bit. Uh, so this is a really neat thing that I've been messing around with. Um, so specifically with uh, There Will Never Be Another You, uh, and actually just going over a lot of other tunes that I, that I usually play and trying to come up with different approaches to them, uh, comping-wise. So... For there will be another you. Uh, I think I'll do some soloing on this later um, in the video. But taking this like, uh, what would be? What would this be? Like a G minor triad, which is the other part of the E flat major seven chord without the E flat. So that's the first chord of there will never be another you. shape for minor 7 flat 5 and so then here's this cool thing where you can go just drop this one note down and now you're playing a 7 flat 5 chord G so which works over with the, the G7 without the G so then taking that idea and now you've got this you're connecting these two chords with a half step in the high the higher register with a small movement of a half step as well. So it's starting to come together where it's a lot more musical. So you can do, let's see. And then C minor seven is right there. This is just the upper half of this C minor seven uh, drop two voicing, drop three. Flat minor seven, just bringing it down a whole step, or you could go up, up, drop this one note here, and then you've got an E flat nine, so that's without the bass. That's really nice. Then you can of course drop the nine down to uh, to a root, and you have kind of like a, a standard dominant chord. So let's see then. A flat major seven. Uh, D flat nine. That would work for E flat major seven again. And that would be C minor seven. So so far we have something like this. for me to wrap my head around because I am so familiar with the larger drop two voicings. There's some work I need to do with, um, I've done plenty of work with triads in the past, work being like I learned them and ran them up and down the fretboard. I would do stuff like this, which I can't even remember. That kind of thing. I would do that all the time on all string sets and go, yeah, cool, I got my triads, and then I would go play something else for a long time. So now I'm starting to uh, find a really practical application of it, for, of those for comping reasons. Uh, so that's cool. Um, yeah, so let's see, what's the latter half of that tune? So D9, A, Anyway, 
anyway, so it's, it's cool because it's getting me to play these sort of what would be, I would think in my head are sort of larger voicings like the nine, not that, I mean, not that they're difficult, but just like playing nine chords, ninth chords or minor. I said that was 11 earlier, that's minor nine. Um, playing 13s, stuff like that. Flat nine. That also works for sharp nine, so that same shape. That's B flat. 13 can also be E uh, seven sharp nine, which is cool. So you get the same shape. Uh, and that's a really neat thing about it too, is that these shapes will work for multiple different chord types. And I'm still kind of wrapping my head around that and practicing that, but uh, it's been really cool. Um, already I can hear my comping is starting to be, have better voice leading. I'm connecting things. I'm playing more interesting sounds. You know, whatever. Just kind of having this freedom to move around a little bit um, is, has been really nice. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing was something I got actually from a coworker during our trip that we took, um, which was something I haven't spent a whole ton of time doing yet, but something I want to start doing more and thinking about, which is uh, when you're soloing. So at one point he and I were playing uh, and it was just like a vamp, like it was nothing complicated. Just really like a funk vamp on a nine chord. Uh, and he was just kind of wailing on the saxophone. Uh, and it's really cool because I was just noticing that he was kind of just feeling it out, right? We were not playing a song that that is known or written down. We were just messing around. So he didn't have anything to go on except that chord. There's no melody to kind of play off of or, or chord changes to play off of, um, which, you know, is should be really freeing because you can kind of just do whatever you want. But I find that it's, it's difficult to make something happen when you don't have uh, all this information that you're playing off of. Uh, so I was noticing that he would he would play a note, play another note, then kind of go back and forth, and then sort of gradually go larger and more complex based on this sort of early uh, simple groove that he had established. And you could tell that as we were jamming, he was just kind of figuring it out. He was just it was truly improvising with absolutely nothing to go on. Uh, and I thought that was really neat. Um, and we talked about it a little bit. And one thing that he said was. Uh, to, or at least the way I put it, is say something, say it again, and then say something else. So uh, don't be afraid to repeat yourself and actually try to repeat yourself in certain cases um, because it grabs the listener, right? And, and it helps you create continuity to your solo or contour or whatever you want to say. It's not just a bunch of stuff crammed together. You've got these repetitious parts which listeners will pick up on and will bring some sense of order to what you're doing, even if you're improvising. Um, so that's something that I wanna, I wanna think about and work on, play a lick or a phrase, and then try to play it again over the next chord changes or, or whatever. I mean, maybe making modifications if it needs to, or maybe even just following the same rhythm. You know, something that makes these two things sound basically the same, or at least like they are related. Uh, and then you can come back on the third go round and make um, more of like a response to it. Okay, now you can bring in a new idea and it wor can work either as a totally new thing or as a complement to what you just finished playing and repeating. Which really, it makes total sense from like a songwriting standpoint. You play the verse, then you play another verse, and then you play the chorus, right? You say something, you say it again, maybe in a little bit different way, but basically the same, and then you say something different. Um, Anyway, that's how I've been interpreting it, and I think it's really, really cool. Uh, and that goes along with the whole like stop or go thing I was talking about in the last one, which is just being more mindful, not being so frantic about playing a bunch of stuff, but like taking a moment and doing kind of what he did, just play a note, play another note, play with the rhythm, figure something out, you know, build it up from something when you have something to say uh, and be you know, present and focused on what you're doing. Um, anyway, that's a perhaps never ending battle, but something I've been thinking about. Um, and I think that's all the new stuff. I've been spending my time mostly just running tunes um, rather than trying to acquire a bunch of new stuff, just like getting these tunes down that I know uh, really well. So what we're gonna try 
now is I'm going to play There Will Never Be Another You. I've got it queued up here in Band in a Box. Um, Chet Baker, there's a one version of this that he does that has this neat intro. If I can remember it. Something like that. So I'm going to try. I've got pre-played the first few beats of the count in for this tune. I'm going to try to play that and then hit pause, hit unpause, and then jump into the tune. Uh, and I'll play the head and then solo a few choruses and then play the head and we'll call it. So here we go. Let's give this a whirl. <laughs> okay. start again because I do know this song I promise okay let's try this again
it had its moments, right? Not terrible. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's cool. There were courses in there where I was clearly just like scrambling or just hitting wrong notes and not recovering all that well. Uh, and then there were times when, and this is how it usually goes, where I kind of just like stop, take a deep breath, take a stop worrying about it, and then play more by ear, where I'm just kind of following what sounds good to me, what I feel like will sound good. That's always the best stuff. Um, so I'm trying to find like a mixture of the two because I, I don't feel like I can play, um, I can connect changes all that well by purely by ear, but I also can't make interesting, uh, you know, like genuine music when I'm just trying to hit changes. So there's like a, a combination in there. Uh, and then with a healthy dose of just like shutting up and waiting until something comes to you or starting small and developing an idea or whatever. Anyway, it's getting better. So thank you for watching. Uh, I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.